I'm Craig Christina. I'm the Associate Executive Director for Texas Baptist, for the Baptist General Convention of Texas. So on behalf of Dr. David Hardage, our Executive Director, I bring you greetings and uh, just want you to know how much we love and appreciate First Baptist Waxahachie. I got to preach here a couple of years ago, right before COVID hit, and uh, it's great to see a healthy church. It's great to see the leadership of your pastor, David Ritzema. He's doing an awesome job, and we're so excited what the Lord is doing in his life personally, but also through his leadership here at the church. Well, it's been a rough couple of years, hadn't it? With COVID, with the, the stress of life. I saw an article a couple of weeks ago uh, from a blogger by the name of Rebecca Walls. She writes an article called Living Word, which is on Jim Dennison's uh, the Forum of Truth and Culture on their, their webpage. And this is what she wrote a couple of weeks ago. She said, we've all experienced significant stress over the last two years, and many of our lives are being disrupted because of it. In fact, as of April 11th, 2022, so this past month, April, 38.3% of Americans, 38.3% of Americans reported symptoms of depression at least several days a week. And 45.6% reported feelings of anxiety. Brothers and sisters, do you, do you hear what that's saying? That's saying about four out of 10 of the people around you and me are dealing with depression or anxiety. Maybe some of you are dealing with depression or anxiety. I mean, it's been a hard two years with COVID. Uh, it's been challenging to live through a pandemic and the, and the tumult that's caused in our lives. It's been a challenge uh, coming out of it with uh, the economy and if inflation sky high. People are worried about that, stressed out about that. There's a war taking place in Ukraine this morning, and uh, people are worried and stressed out about that. But maybe it's not just what's happening in the world or in our country. Maybe it's about what's happening in your life. There's an old Spanish proverb that says, there is no home that will not eventually experience its own hush. Things happen to all of us. Challenges come. Trouble comes. It's a part of being here on planet Earth. And yet when it comes, do we freak out? Do we panic? Do we give in to anxiety and stress? Or can we experience the peace of God? If you have your Bible, open it with me to Philippians chapter 4. Verses 6 and 7, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. I want to share with you a couple of my favorite verses from the book of Philippians. And by the way, I would just tell you that if you uh, need some power in your life spiritually, if you need some encouragement, if you need some wisdom, the book of Philippians is a great book. I, I, I have been impacted by so many verses from Philippians. My call to ministry came from Philippians 3, verse 13, uh, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize of the heavenward call of God in Christ Jesus. I love Philippians 1, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through him, through Christ who strengthens me. On and on in the book of Philippians, uh, we have really power verses for our life. But here in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, Paul is going to talk to us about how we can engage with the peace of God, even in the midst of stressful times. Let's look at that together. He says in Philippians 4, starting in verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I love that phrase, the peace of God. The peace of God. You know, in uh, the Hebrew, the word peace is shalom. And in the Greek language, the word is irene. And both talk more than just about the absence of conflict. The world's definition of peace is there's no conflict. In fact, really the world's definition, culture, cultural definition is, is really about comfort. If I can be comfortable with my life, if I can be in a place of comfort, then I can have peace. If there's money in my bank account, if I get that promotion at work, if there's no conflict in my marriage, I, I can have peace in my life. They, they base peace totally on circumstances. That's not what Paul's talking about. That's not what the peace of God is. The peace of God is something that comes from God himself. You see, God is whole and complete in himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
He, there's no imbalance to the Godhead. Uh, there's no, not a time when, when uh, God, you know, loses control or, or, or gets freaked out about life, right? Uh, God is perfect, he's complete, he's holy, but he's whole in himself. And, and so it's shalom and peace is a wellness regardless of the storm around you. It's a wholeness. It's everything's gonna be okay in my life. That's, that's the peace of God. And, and, and yes, you know, there are times when, when there are emotions and there's times when there's stress in our life, but we can have this wellness of soul. And it's a peace, Paul says, which transcends all understanding. All understanding. In other words, it doesn't make sense logically, reasonably. It's a peace that, that, that can happen regardless of the circumstances. We can still experience perfect peace. You see, God can get upset with circumstances, Right? I mean, just look at Jesus in the temple with the money changers. God has emotions. We're made in the image of God. We have emotions. But just because, according to Scripture, God sometimes feels anger or jealousy or, or wrath or uh, grief doesn't mean that God has conflict or imbalance within himself. And this is a concept we've got to understand because what it means is that we can experience grief and still have peace. We might feel outraged over something, but still have peace. We might be disappointed by what happens in our lives, and yet it still be okay. We still have peace. Even though circumstances are negative, we can experience perfect peace. The world doesn't get that. They base peace on and comfort on circumstances. But, but Paul is telling us here that there is a peace God has which he can give us, which passes understanding or what makes sense to the world. And, and when we can get that kind of peace, Paul says it will do what? It will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It will guard. So when the Philippians heard that, the church in Philippi, uh, a peace which will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, they, they thought probably about the Roman garrison that guarded the city of Philippi, that, that were encamped around Philippi, protected them from attack. This is what the peace of God does. It protects our hearts, which in Greek thinking is our emotions, and our minds, which is the intellect. It's our thought life. Have you ever uh, felt an emotion and, and really let it get you carried away, carry you away someplace where you didn't want to go? Or do you have a thought that popped in your, your mind and, and you began to dwell on that and you invited it to come in and stay and, and it got more and more negative and more and more anxious about what might happen, what could happen, what could this be? I've got a friend of mine who uh, every time he has an ache or pain, it's cancer. You know, he's convinced that, oh, it's going to be cancer. No, no, let's not go there. It might be, you know, and, and God will work that together for good somehow. He'll, he'll get you through it. But, but, you know, don't just automatically assume everything bad that happens is going to be worst case scenario. We all can give in to that sometimes. So this is a piece that guards against that, that guards our emotions so we don't let them carry us away, that guards our thinking so that we don't just think negative thoughts. It will protect us against that. Well, how does it do that? How can we experience that? How can we get that kind of peace? Brothers and sisters, there's three things Paul tells us to do here to experience the peace of God that will guard, that will protect you from giving way to anxiety, giving way to depression. And, and let me just say, I know there's, there's clinical issues with depression, and, and I think uh, everyone should visit with a physician if they feel like they're really battling uh, depression. You should get professional counseling, professional help. But we should also know about the peace of God, which can protect us and guard us from our thoughts, from our emotions getting carried away. How do we get that kind of peace? Three things. The first thing Paul says is, number one, pause, pause. Hit the pause button. He says in verse six, do not be anxious about anything. Literally, it's a command. Stop worrying. That's what Paul says here in the Greek. It's an imperative. It's a command. It's an order. Stop worrying. You know who else says that in the New Testament? Jesus in the Gospels. Uh, Matthew chapter six, do not Worry about what you're going to eat or drink or the clothes, what you're going to wear. Jesus talks about that. Don't give in to worry. Don't give in to stress. Don't give in. Just stop it. Hit the pause button. Instead, Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things are going to work out. They'll be added to you as well. Why would Jesus and Paul tell us to stop worrying? Because they know our feelings can get out of control. Our thoughts can get out of control. Anger is a feeling. And, you know, there are people that, that, that experience anger and, uh, you know, or sadness or, or grief or, or, you know, lust is a feeling. We don't have to let these feelings get away and, and take us away. 
We cannot control the existence of feelings, right? I mean, you're a human being, you're gonna feel something, but we can control what we do with it. I can feel anger, but I don't have to let it carry me away into lashing out at someone. I may feel sadness or grief, but I don't have to let it carry me away into despair. I might feel lust, but I don't have to let it carry me away into flirtatiousness. We cannot control the existence of feelings, but we can control what we do with them. Same thing is true with our thoughts. This was so liberating to me when I realized I can't control a thought that pops into my mind. I can control what I do with it. I can control if I dwell on it, right, and entertain it and let it set up shop in my mind. We can control what we do with these things. We can control how we respond to these things. So when we have a feeling, when we have a thought, when we have something like this happening that's about to carry us away, Paul says, you gotta hit the pause button. Stop. Stop being anxious or stressed out or freaked out about you about it. One of the blessings I love about Sunday morning worship, in-person worship, is that for me, it's like hitting the pause button, right? For one hour a week, I can set aside all the junk that's happened, all the stuff I've worried about. I can come in, I can fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. Before the first service this morning, I was talking to folks as they were coming in, there was these three men, you know, and they're like, are, are you gonna preach a toe stomper today? Are you stepping on our toes? Because, you know, these two guys here are sinners and they need to hear it, but I don't, so I'm leaving if you are, you know. I'm like, no, no, I hope it's encouraging. I'm not, it's not a toe stomper today. But you know, we can joke with each other. We can have fun. I, I love coming to a small group Bible study. You get in the word together, and of course you fellowship and encourage one another. You can ask questions. What does this mean? How does this apply? How does this work? And what does this look like in my life? I, I love a quiet time, right, where I can just spend time with the Lord. That hits the pause button on all the garbage and junk and stress and strain I've got to worry about, all the, all the things I've got to get done. I can, just, I can just stop thinking about that and get in God's word. Let him feed me and nourish me through it. Let him speak to me through it and, and talk to him in return, right, and share with him the burdens and the concerns on my heart and, 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 and have that intimacy with our heavenly father. I think volunteering and serving is a way to hit the pause button. Look, if you're feeling anxious and stressed out and worried about something in your life, you know one of the best ways you can deal with that? Go help somebody else. Go do something nice for somebody else. It's much more blessed to give than it is to receive. Go do something for someone else. Serve. You have a gift or gifts that God has given you to help you do your part to build his kingdom. I don't know what that is, but if I were you and I didn't know what that was, I'd talk to one of the ministers on staff here. Hey, help me figure out what I can do. Give me some options of how I can serve and find my niche, find where I fit here, helping others uh, through the ministry of First Baptist. Hit the pause button. Stop worrying. When you know you're getting stressed out and freaked out, pause. But there's a second thing that we have to then do, Paul tells us, and that is number two, pray. Pray. He says in verse six, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, present your request to God. So petition is just another way of presenting what you need to someone or what you would like someone to do. Same, different kind of way of talking about prayer. By prayer and petition. Hitting the pause button is a good first step, but then we've got to take it to God and we've got to pray. We've got to talk to God. Paul says not just some of the time, but in every situation. Every little thing that comes up, you can pray. You don't have to stop and get on your knees and pray. You can just stop and shoot a prayer up to the Lord and, and, and talk to him. Because when we fall on our knees, when we stop to pray, you know what we're really doing? We're crawling into God's lap. We're crawling into God's lap. You know that your heavenly father is your Abba, Daddy, and he loves you so much, and he longs for us. He doesn't need anything from us. He's perfect and complete as he is, but he still desires we, his children, to crawl up into his lap and talk to him, to spend time with him. When I was a little boy, uh, my father was a dentist, and he had the same routine every day when he got home from work. He did the same thing. He'd come home from the office, he'd take off his shirt, being be his undershirt, you know. He'd grab the evening newspaper, sit in his recliner, turn on the evening news, read his paper while mom was making dinner. Same thing happened every day. And as a little boy, I'd been home alone with mom all day, and so mom was great, loved my parents, they're both still living. Amazingly, my dad's gonna be 90 this year, so blessed that they're still here, and I, I've had that blessing of getting to experience them on earth for so long, but uh, mom was great, loved my mom, great mom, but I hadn't seen dad all day, and I was a very affectionate child, and so when dad got home, 
and I walked into the den and I saw him there in his recliner. I did the same thing every day. I'd go and crawl up in his lap and I'd lay my head on his shoulder. And sometimes we'd talk, but not really. It wasn't about talking or, you know, engaging in conversation. It was just his presence, just being in his presence. And in my little mind, that meant I was safe. It kind of recalibrated my, my day, my life. All was well in my little world because dad was home. Mom was great, loved mom being home too, but, but now dad was home and I was good. See, prayer is a way to recalibrate our, our lives. And, and not just, God, I need this, this, and this, but, but really spending time with him, letting him wrap his arms of love around you and holding you close and comforting you with the presence of his Holy Spirit. It's gonna be okay. You're gonna get through this. I've got this worked out already. I know you don't know what it is, I'm not gonna tell you what it is. That's where faith comes in, but we have to trust him. God promises, I will work all things together for good for those who love him, who are called according to his purposes. We either believe that or we don't. We either have faith in God that, he, that his promises come true 100% of the time, or we don't believe that's true. But if you're a Christian, we need to believe that's true because it's true. It's gonna work out, it's gonna be okay. And, and if we will crawl into his lap and we will spend time talking to him but listening to him, reading his word, learning, letting him speak to us. We can pray and spend time with him and, and, and know that it's gonna be okay. Prayer is resting in the presence of God as he holds us close and comforts our soul that no matter what else is wrong in our lives, in the lap of my heavenly father, everything's gonna be okay. There's no, there, hear me, there is no better place in all the world to be than right in the center of God's will for your life, right in the center of his presence. And even when we try to run away from him, he, he's with us, he goes with us. He doesn't, he doesn't ever turn us loose. Pause, pray, one more thing, one more thing, to have the peace of God that passes all understanding. And that is number three, praise, praise. Paul says, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, that's praise. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. Tell God what's on your heart. Tell him why you feel overwhelmed. Tell him what you're worried about. But do it all in an attitude of thanksgiving, of praising him. Why? Well, for one thing, God is worthy of our praise. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, if you're following Jesus as Lord, he's already blessed you immeasurably more than you or I deserve or could ever expect. He has saved us from sin and destruction, eternal damnation. He, he has rescued us from the destructive way of life we were living, and he has put a new heart in us. He has made us into a new creation. He has given us his Holy Spirit. He has given us the fruit, the one piece of fruit of his spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He, he has given us direct access to him anytime. He empowers us and equips us to do his will. He goes before us and makes a way. I mean, he has blessed us so richly in so many ways. He is worthy of our worship and our praise. But also, we need to remember that Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter, and I think he has something else. Why does Paul tell us to, to combat anxiety with praise? Well, remember, the only way to combat a negative thought is just not to think about it. It's kind of like me trying to diet. You know, if all I do is think about not eating food, guess what I'm thinking about all day? I'm thinking about eating food. <laughs> I'm thinking about the food I shouldn't eat. Replace it with something positive, right? So when you have negative, which in the case of dieting, which obviously I'm not doing a great job of right now, but would be exercise, you know, or getting up, reading a book, doing something, or taking a walk, doing something else that, that would be rather than eating what I want to eat. But uh, when it comes to the negative thoughts, you have to replace it with a positive thought. It's not a matter of just not thinking about your problems. Think about the positive things. Think about the blessings. Think about what God has done in your life and how he has blessed you. Think about your blessings and praise God for past, current, and future blessings. When I think about past blessings in my life, I think about growing up in a Christian home. I know that's not everyone's story. I'm blessed that that's my story. Becoming a Christian at the age of nine years old, I think about I rebelled in high school and I rebelled against God's call on my life, but he still didn't turn me loose. And he really put so much pressure on me in my spirit that I knew I was coming to a crossroads where I had to repent and give in to him and say yes, and it was a, sur a surrender to him. I thank God for that. He didn't have to do that. I thank God that I went to seminary and... Uh, 
I was single in seminary, working on my master's degree, Master of Divinity, and then I started my PhD, and I met my wife, Tracy, who's here with me this morning, and she has her Master of Divinity at, at Southern, from Southern Seminary as well. And uh, God has blessed us with two beautiful children, a, a daughter and then a son, and now he's blessed us with a son-in-law. Our daughter got married this past. I think about all the past blessings, and I have to praise him. I think about my present blessings. I got to serve as a pastor for 25 years, the last 10 years in Dallas, and then the convention called me to come work with them, and I've uh, been there almost three years now, and what, a, what <laughs> an incredible blessing to be a part of the work that we do together as Texas Baptists. Did you know we're on 130 college campuses around the state? People worry about the next generation. We are reaching the next generation on college campuses all over the state of Texas. I heard a story just this past week about this young man at Sam Houston State. This young man is lost, comes his freshman year, finds Jesus, becomes a leader. The next year, he leads a student who gets their freshman lost, doesn't know, leads him to the Lord. The next year, that guy leads him to the Lord. It's this multi-generational disciple-making strategy that's happening on our college campuses. And, and they're gonna get out there in the world and continue to do this, continue to shine for Christ. I think about Baptist chaplaincy. That's something we don't talk about too much, but Texas Baptists have now become the fourth largest endorser of military chaplains. We have more Texas Baptist Air Force chaplains than any other denomination. And our troops are in harm's way. Our chaplains go with them, and we need to pray for them. We need to pray for them this morning. I think about church starting all over the state of Texas, all different kinds of uh, ethnicities and multi-ethnic churches that we're starting. I think about uh, the partnership we're about to announce with the International Mission Board. They want, us to, they want Texas Baptists to adopt South Asia and uh, do the missionary adoption program there, which I'd love to tell you about some time. Or North American Mission Board wants to set up a disaster response center in Laredo in partnership with us and our Texas Baptist River Ministry missionaries. We have 44 River Ministry missionaries working both sides of the border with Mexico and uh, helping to meet needs in what is truly a humanitarian crisis. I could go on and on about praising God for the blessings of the present. And I think about the future. You know, we, we have people that go home and, and they're with us for a while on this journey on earth and their loved ones and, and, and we have to say goodbye. But if they know the Lord, we're gonna be with them again one day. We're gonna be together at, at, at the foot of the throne of Jesus, praising him for all eternity and, and, and working for him and doing so much more. I, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I want you to know it ends in victory. If you're a believer, it ends well for you. It's gonna be okay, and, and God's got a great plan for you, and, and you're gonna to get to be in paradise forever with his people praising him. Brothers and sisters, we've got to praise God. Thank him for all the good. Don't think about the negative. Don't focus on the negative. That's so easy to do. It, we could do that all day. We've gotta stop, pause, pray, and praise him for the great things he has done, is doing, and are to come. Pro baseball player R.A. Dickey was the 2012 National League Cy Young Award winner, highest award in professional baseball for pitchers. But Dickey's career almost ended before it started. In 1996, he came to play for the Texas Rangers. He was offered a $810,000 contract, which was, is a lot of money now, but it was a lot of money in 1996. And, uh, he, he went to spring training and had to go through a routine physical. And in that physical, they took x-rays of his body and they noticed a ligament missing in his pitching arm, his elbow. So his agent showed up, called him off the field and said, hey, Doug Melvin, the, the Rangers general manager, needs to talk to you. They went and stepped into Melvin's office and Dickey had just been praising God. He was a, he's a Christian. He was thanking God on the field for the blessing of, of this wonderful career. But he said that he goes into Melvin's office and Melvin flatly said, we're gonna retract our offer. We think there's something wrong with your elbow. In his book, Wherever I Wind Up, R.A. Dickey writes, I tried to take in those words for a second or two. We're going to retract our offer. I don't feel devastation or even anger. I feel rage, complete rage. It feels as if it starts in my toes and blasts upward through my body like a tsunami, into my guts and right up through the top of my head. I want to tell Melvin about how this is the one thing that I can do right. This is the one thing that makes me somebody. I want to make sure he knows that he's matter-of-factly dropped his atomic bomb on my baseball career, on my life. 
but it's as if there's a strong hand on my shoulder holding me back, giving me pause. In that instant, I have a self-control that wasn't there a moment earlier, and I hear a voice in my mind say, relax, I've got you. Relax, R.A. It's okay, I've got you. The voice is the Holy Spirit. I was just talking to God in prayer out on the field, and now he's talking back, giving me a composure that could not have come from anywhere else. The tsunami passes. I'm crushed by Doug Melvin's words, but I'm not going to do anything stupid. I have total peace now, because in that moment, God said, I've got you. Have you ever experienced that? I have one time, very similar situation, where I received devastating news from someone I loved. Just broke my heart, crushed me, and, and just started feeling overwhelmed. And, and God just immediately surrounded me with this peace and says, Craig, I've got this. I'm going to take care of this. It's okay. It's okay. It's a peace that passes understanding. And it's something that can guard and protect our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So how do we get that peace? We need to be in Christ Jesus. We need to give our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ as Lord. We need to believe what he did for us on the cross through the resurrection. We need to ask him to forgive us and take control of our lives as Lord. And he makes us into a new creation, gives us his Holy Spirit. And then when we're feeling anxious, grief-stricken, overwhelmed by life, pause, pray, and praise. And we can get through it in victory because of him. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are such a great and awesome God. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much, and you've proven that. Over and over again you prove it, but you've proven it through the cross and, and through the resurrection by giving us eternal life. What a, what a blessing to be forgiven. What a blessing to not be in sin, but to be in grace, to be in love, to be forgiven to be made whole. And Lord, we still struggle. We struggle with emotions and thoughts. We struggle with sin. We struggle, Lord, with when bad things happen and we feel overwhelmed. But thank you, Abba Daddy, that we can crawl up in your lap and know it's gonna be okay. You're gonna get us through because of who you are and because of what you will do. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your peace. We need it. We ask for it. We receive it. In Jesus' name, amen.